People with impaired nasal breathing often rely on nasal decongestant sprays to be able to sleep or function properly. However, they often don't realise the harm that long-term usage of these sprays can cause. In this show, we'll talk about why people are overusing these sprays, what dangers they pose and what can be done to stop this dangerous practice. This is Euphoria News broadcasting from London. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News, I'm Dr David Bull. Topical decongestants are typically used in the relief of nasal congestion due to allergic rhinitis, acute or chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps or upper respiratory tract infections. However, long-term use of these nasal decongestants can cause rebound swelling of the nasal mucosa and this is called rhinitis medicamentosa and is classified as a subset of drug-induced rhinitis. The earliest nasal decongestants, mainly derived from ephedrine, showed rhinitis medicamentosa developing as early as three days after use and up to four to six weeks after use. All pharmacists therefore advise patients not to use decongestant sprays for more than two weeks. Well, here to tell us more is Mrs. Sophie Scheer. She is a pharmacist and PhD fellow at Ghent University in Belgium. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Let's talk about your study. I actually have it here in front of me. It was published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and you looked at rhinitis medicamentosa. What exactly did your study show? Well, we've actually taken the time, time that I think ENT uh, physicians in their practice not really have, to really talk to these patients and see why they are using these sprays, why they continue using these sprays, despite being warned by their healthcare professionals. And we were actually uh, surprised by the answers they gave us. Patients don't want to keep using these sprays or drops, but they feel like it's the only thing that can help them. Um, and there are many reasons why they want to withdraw, but they feel like the barriers to withdraw currently outweigh the potential benefits for them. So, so having gleaned that information, they say they want to continue using them. Why? Because they actually choose for their comfort. Um, the nasal congestion greatly impacts their daily life. For example, uh, they have disturbed taste. They have uh, troubles focusing at their jobs. Um, they uh, also feel like um, they have to speak uh, in a different way because they do not have the potential to breathe freely through their nose. And so that's why they use a nasal decongestant. But the main driver is to have a good night's sleep. And to them, the use of the nasal decongestant is the only thing that can provide them with a good night's sleep. If not, their nose is blocked and they do not feel like they have an alternative treatment. So they keep using these types of uh, sprays and drops, despite being warned that it might have detrimental effects. Mm, and I can completely understand why they would do that. Now, just in terms of that, I said at the beginning that pharmacists say you should only use them for, say, two weeks. Can you outline for us what the consequences are of overuse? What are the dangers if you continually to use these in the way that uh, many of the patients say they are? Well, if you use it for what it was intended for, so the treatment of a common cold, there's no issue there. Um, however, if you keep using it for a longer period of time and then you stop using it, you experience rebound congestion. So the patient feels the same experience, uh, a blocked nose, and they are actually prompted to use the nasal spray again. And they end up in a vicious cycle where they uh, temporarily uh, treat, but also cause their own nasal congestion. And it's really difficult to break this vicious cycle. Um, of course, if you keep using these sprays for a longer period of time, you're also risking to feel the benefits in a systemic way. So it's also likely that it can get absorbed in the bloodstream and therefore cause insomnia or elevated blood pressure. And of course, rhinitis medicamentosa is a preventable disease. So in your opinion, what can be done to raise awareness of this? And what message should we all in the medical community be conveying? As it is a preventable condition, um, it's key at the first dispensing, so in the pharmacy. Uh, and nowadays we have to take into account also through online channels. Um, 
that this spray can only be used for a short period of time, so five to seven days. Um, and we also need to warn patients that if it's not resolved by then, the nasal congestion, there are other options. So despite the fact that they have a bottle where there's still um, probably some nasal decongestant available, they need to switch therapies. They need to find a physician to actually diagnose if there's an other underlying condition that needs treatment. And if a physician uh, sees a patient that's already suffering from rhinitis medicamentosa, I think we need to pay attention that we do not, um, how should I say this? Uh, we need to empathize because these patients really suffer from their nasal congestion and they are ashamed. They feel guilty. They, and most patients know that they shouldn't use it for a longer period of time, but they do not feel like they have an effective alternative or they consider themselves addicted and they postpone seeing a physician. So when we do have the conversation with the patient, if they are already suffering from rhinitis medicamentosa, is to be really gentle with them, provide adequate follow-up and alternative treatment. One other thing, let's just talk about the OTC status. That's the over-the-counter status of these drugs in many countries. What, what's the situation when you do look at the various countries in question? Well, in many countries, it's available over the counter. Um, and I think, I believe it's a good thing for the treatment of a common cold. If we would have to send everyone with a common cold to a general practitioner, um, this would cause a tremendous burden on our healthcare systems. However, we do need to get um, a good system of gatekeepers, like the, the pharmacist or the, the prescribing physician, to pay attention that when people come and visit them with the question of, I have nasal congestion, what should I do? that we pick out the people that are already treating themselves, self-managing their nasal congestion with a nasal decongestant. Because if it's over the counter, they can keep buying it and we need to pick up if a patient is continuing to using treatment that is not adequate for them. And then I suppose finally, uh, just, just carrying on from that point, let's just touch on the importance of collaboration. Uh, that is between primary care, pharmacists, GPs, also specialists. What should they be doing? How do they talk together? Well, most pe people will be seen by the pharmacist or their general practitioner because nasal congestion is a very frequently encountered sy symptom. Um, but we need to refer in time. If the nasal congestion cannot be adequately treated in the first line uh, of our treatment position, so in the pharmacy or at the general practitioner's office, then we need to refer to an ENT doctor to actually have a look in the nose. Is there something that we're missing? Can we do skin prick testing, for example? We need to get to the bottom of what might be causing the nasal congestion and treat the underlying medical condition. Well, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed to Mrs. Sophie Shea. Thank you very much, Dr. Bull. <laughs> Well, joining me now is Professor Philip Hevar. He is a professor of rhinology and allergy at Ghent University in Belgium. He's also a Euphoria Rhinitis panel member. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, I've just been talking to Mrs. Sophie Scher about rhinitis medicamentosa, its causes and what can be done to avoid it. But from your point of view, can you just outline what are the dangers of taking long-term use of nasal decongestant sprays? Yes, the problem with the use, the long-term use of nasal decongestants uh, is that your nose is getting... Uh, actually addicted to the effect of it. So normally our nose will uh, swell and unswell from its own. It's our neurological system that regulates this swelling and unswelling. Now, if you take these decongestions too long, what happens is that the uh, unswelling of the nose doesn't work properly anymore. It only works when you use the spray. So it's a real kind of addiction. And that's a problem because then your nose will be blocked all the time unless you use the spray and then you will use the spray more. And then again, uh, it, it, it creates that your nose cannot unswell itself anymore. Yeah, and that's exactly what patients are saying. They know they shouldn't take these for more than two weeks and yet they keep taking these sprays because it helps them to sleep. That's exactly what Mrs. Scher said, said to me just a, a few minutes ago. So given that it's an addiction and given that patients find it very hard to get off these sprays, how on earth do you manage such an addiction? As all addictions, you have to explain first to the patient how it works so that their nose is swollen 
not because of something else, but because of the use of the nasal decongestion. And of course, we have to look in most of the patients, there can be an underlying condition that was the uh, first problem. So you can have a septal deviation, you can have a chronic sinusitis, uh, you can have a, an allergy, an allergic rhinitis, a house dust mite allergy. And of course, you have to first treat those causes before you put them then to stop the uh, spray. And, and, and I think that's important. So first, explain them that their blocked nose is due to the use of the spray. And second, take away a possible underlying cause. You, of course, you, we also have patients where there was no underlying cause, only they just had a cold and then it started and they got addicted. So, so what advice then would you give to a patient, say, that has been on a nasal decongestant spray for, say, more than two weeks? Do you say cut down or do you say we need to taper it off or do we just stop? No. So after we have investigated the underlying causes, we treat the underlying causes, but of course we try to stop them. And how do we do that? We start another spray. And the other spray is a nasal spray with uh, nasal corticoids, intranasal corticoids. And that spray should be used or can be used without any problems long-term. But the problem with that spray is that in contrast to the decongestant spray, this spray works slowly. So, so you need at least to take at 14 days to more until you start feeling the effect. So we start the patient up on the nasal corticoid spray and we tell them, as at the moment that they come, for example, in, in two weeks, that then they have to stop with the decongestion spray and stop forever, throw it away, ban it out of the house, don't buy it anymore. And, and that's how we do that. Um, of course, that looks more easy or than it is. Some patients can do that, but we learned in by the work of Sophie Scher that, of course, if you help patients doing that, that you can be quite successful, but you really have to guide them through this process and explain them very well what the problem is. If that doesn't work, of course, there are other options. And, and we also investigated that you can, for example, uh, the, um, the, the concha inferiors of the, or the, uh, in, in, um, the turbinates in your nose, they are swelling and in swelling, you can cut a part of it and we saw that in many patients that won't be able to stop and then you cut a little bit of that, not, not too much, but a little bit that that helps them to stop with the spray as well. So there are several options. But at first, and that's quite successful, is actually explaining and stopping after the start of another spray with corticoids. Mm. And, and I suppose that's absolutely key to ensure compliance so that patients actually do what you suggest. Yes, and that's the problem. As a doctor, we don't have time. We have long waiting lists and we don't have time to guide the patients to that process. So, so we learned that if we do that in an investigational way where they are, where, where, where the patient have a good follow-up up and they are guided through that, 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 that it works then. But I'm not certain if a doctor get only 10 minutes to tell that and then tell the patient just stop that it will always be that successful as we have in our investigation. Sadly, I think, I think you're right there. Uh, it's always about time. Thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. Uh, thank you to Professor Philip Hevar. Thank you. Well, that's it for this Euphoria News. Many thanks to my guest, to Mrs. Sophie Scheer, and also Professor Philip Hevar. Really, really fascinating stuff. Now, you can find more information about Euphoria. You can also register for the Euphoria educational events on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. And don't forget to follow us on social media, on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>